you can see here the blind spot test okay um, you can use the uh, test indicated as A like we'll do in the lab um, you can do an alternate test here again um, you can test your left eye using the same technique covering your right eye and then slowly move an object towards you until the pencil appears intact when the gap in the pencil hits your blind spot the areas in your brain are going to fill in the missing information and the pencil will appear as if it were intact to test your right eye turn your book upside down cover your left eye and repeat the process so you can do this with the um, figure in your textbook 1514 or um, you can make your own 3x5 index card in order to determine the location of your blind spot. Incidentally, while we're on the topic of <clears throat> binocular vision, you should note that the visual information that you get from your right and your left eye as you look out in front of you is a little bit different. And that's integrated and interpreted by the brain as depth. And that's very important because without depth perception, it would have been very difficult for the human species to hunt and to flee um, in order to feed and get out of danger. Uh, the old acronym is um, Eyes in Front Likes to Hunt. If you don't believe me, cover one eye and try and play catch with somebody and you'll find that it's extremely difficult to do. Now the lens is a slightly flattened sphere found behind the pupil and the iris. It focuses light on the retina from objects that are near the eye. The ciliary body is connected to the lens by the suspensory ligaments. The lens itself contains lens fibers that lack nuclei and are tightly packed to one another, making them transparent. Again, it's the regular arrangement of these extracellular components and intracellular components in the cornea and in the lens that allow, when light hits it, to bend instead of to scatter okay and so that's the difference between a transparent substance an opaque substance and a translucent substance okay in an opaque substance light cannot pass through okay and the reason being that the light is almost completely absorbed by the material and cannot get to the other side of the layer. That would be like the white of the eye, the sclera. Okay? In a translucent surface, light can pass through, but the light is somewhat scattered. Okay? An analogy would be um, the, the block windows that you see in some garages or elementary schools that let light through, but you can't really see what's on the other side of the glass. Okay? Whereas a transparent layer simply bends the light so that you can clearly see an image on the other side of the surface. Um, and for the purposes of the eyeball, this helps to focus the image onto the sweet spot of the eye, the macula lutea, which again is this area right here. Okay. A cataract is an area that forms in the lens or in the cornea where when the light hits it, it scatters instead of bending. Okay? A transparent lens is critical for vision, and if the light can't pass through the lens, vision's impaired, even if there are functional photoreceptors. A cloudy lens or a cataract is one of the most frequent causes of blindness. Trauma, exposure to UV, and diseases like diabetes can promote cataracts. The most common cause is aging, what happens as we get older is the lens fibers darken and become less organized and this turns the lens milky white. You get an opaque lens. Cataracts can't be reversed so the usual treatment is to replace the entire lens surgically with a synthetic one. This restores vision. Glasses or contact lenses may be required for minor adjustments. Now what's important to note is that both the lens and the cornea can transition from being transparent to being opaque as a result of a variety of degenerative disorders or even simple aging. 
Um, the term for a cloudy lens is cataract. Cloudy cornea is referred to simply as an opaque or cloudy cornea. The effect is the same, which is that uh, light, instead of bending when it hits the eye, becomes um, scattered, and the result then is an unclear image. The cavities and chambers of the eye include the anterior and posterior cavities, which are separated by the lens and the ciliary body. The posterior cavity is the larger cavity behind the lens filled with a gelatinous material called vitreous humor, which is made up mostly of collagen and water and presses the retina against the choroid and maintains the shape of the eyeball. The anterior cavity is in the front of the lens and ciliary body and is split into the anterior and posterior chambers with the posterior being between the lens and iris and the anterior being between the iris and the cornea. Both chambers are filled with aqueous humor which is a blood filtrate secreted by the ciliary body from the posterior chamber through a, the pupil into the anterior chamber and it's drained from the anterior chamber into the scleral venous sinus which is a blood vessel network found at the anterior edge of the iris that drains the aqueous humor out of the anterior chamber. Now sometimes what happens is that there's an impingement of this drainage. The result is an increase in pressure in the eyeball. This is a condition known as glaucoma. The aqueous humor doesn't drain properly and builds up in the anterior and posterior chambers. This raises the pressure inside the eyeball the high pressure pushes on the vitreous that compresses and damages the retina and optic nerve. It's the second leading cause of blindness. It can result from eye infections, meds, or congenital defects in the scleral venous sinus. In most cases, the cause is unknown. Most people who have glaucoma don't have any symptoms other than gradual loss of vision, which can occur slowly, so it may not be detected until the disease is advanced. Unfortunately, lost vision cannot be restored, but progression can be stopped or slowed with medications that either improve drainage or reduce the amount of aqueous humor produced. If the medications fail to control intraocular pressure, we can use surgery in order to intervene. Now you may have heard that one of the treatments for glaucoma is the, um, the use of marijuana. and the research on this is very mixed. It's been shown that the active ingredient in marijuana smoke, THC, can temporarily drop intraocular pressure. However, um, it's not sustainable, and the result is that once the effect passes and the intraocular pressure builds back up, the advance of glaucoma increases. It's also been reported that it can reduce some of the pain associated with the disease. However, any um, prescription painkiller like an opioid is capable of the same effect. So um, the research on um, marijuana and glaucoma is to say the very least mixed. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how vision actually works. It's the perception of light reflected by objects. Remember that an object color is the wavelength of light that bounces off of it the other wavelengths are absorbed by the object. The eyes and the visual pathways in the central nervous system determine the object's size, shape, and color. The object's distance, rate, and direction of movement can also be interpreted by this special sense. Note that in the universe there's a form of energy known as electromagnetic radiation. Okay, It's termed electromagnetic because it has both an electrical and a magnetic component. Okay. It's one of the most unusual forms of energy in that it can propagate through a vacuum. This electromagnetic radiation um, is going to vary in intensity according to its wavelength. Gamma rays and X-rays have short wavelengths, while microwaves and radio waves have long wavelengths. And so gamma and X-rays carry a lot more energy than something like a radio wave would. Visible light is the range of wavelengths that we can perceive. These are the colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biff, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, 
the shorter wavelengths of visible light, which include blue and violet, are going to have more energy than the long wave wavelengths of light, which are in the orange and red range. A photon is the basic unit of light, and it stimulates photoreceptors in the retina. Now, there's a couple of equations that uh, it, it's pre it's good for general knowledge to know these um, that relate um, wavelength and frequency. Okay wavelength indicated by the Greek letter lambda is equal to 1 over frequency. Okay. Wavelength is simply the distance between two peaks of a wave. Right? If this were a wave, wavelength would be from peak to peak here. Right? And frequency is simply the number of waves that pass a particular point in a particular amount of time. Okay, So the higher the frequency, the more rapidly the wave passes that particular fixed physical point. Now why do I say that energy is directly related to frequency? Well there's an equation E equals H nu, where E is energy, H is a constant, and nu is the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation. Okay, um, So what we see here is that the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. Okay, as a result, the smaller the wavelength, the higher the energy of the associated wave. Okay, this little h here is called Planck's constant. Okay, you probably learned about it if you've taken physics here at UC or uh, perhaps in high school. And the relationship between frequency and wavelength goes really for any waveform. Light rays can be bent, which means they are refracted, when they pass through a translucent object. The refractive index of an object measures the amount of refraction it exerts on the light rays. Air has a refractive index of 1, which means that light passing through air is not significantly bent, but water has a higher refractive index than air and thus can significantly refract light. And so you can see the behavior of light when moving from mediums that have the same optical density, the direction of the ray of light does not change, whereas when we go from an optically less dense to more dense medium, the light will be bent towards midline. Okay, so you can do this experiment at home with a pencil and a glass of water. You put the pencil in a glass of water so that half of it's out of the water and half of it's in the water, and when you look at the pencil, from the outside of the cup, it looks like it's broken, when in fact it really isn't, and that's due, again, to the bending of the light rays. Refraction of light depends on the angle at which the light strikes the surface of the object. The greater angle causes greater refraction. As a result, curved surfaces bend light rays more at their edges. A convex lens has a surface that bulges outward at the middle and causes the light rays to converge or focus as they pass through it, while a concave one is thicker on the edge and is depressed in the middle and causes the light rays to diverge or spread out. Okay, we'll find out that it's the use of these kinds of lenses that can treat conditions such as myopia and hyperopia. That's nearsightedness and farsightedness. Note that clear vision requires that light rays are focused on the retina, not in front or behind it. The function of the lens and the cornea is shown here. Two-thirds of the eye's refractive power occurs as light passes through the cornea, and this has a refractive index close to that of water. The lens provides for fine-tuning and refractive adjustment. In the emetropic state, the eye is relaxed and focusing on distant objects. The lens is in its normal flattened shape. Parallel light rays are minimally refracted by the cornea and focused on the retina, whereas light rays from objects closer to the eye need increased refraction greater than the cornea alone can provide as they are more scattered. The lens changes shape into a more thickened shape known as accommodation. The thicker lens refracts the light more than a flattened lens so that more light rays get focused on the retina. And so this is the property of the muscles that change the shape of the lens. 
if we look here at the lens itself, remember that it's connected by ciliary bodies to, uh, by suspensory ligaments to the ciliary body. This surrounds the lens and relaxes when viewing distant objects. It pulls this sphincter-like smooth muscle away from the lens and this creates tension on the suspensory ligaments and this flattens the lens and reduces its refractive capability. So it makes the lens long and thin. Okay. The ciliary body contracts when viewing a nearby object and this allows for a phenomenon known as accommodation. The ciliary body moves closer to the lens and the suspensory ligaments become slack and this allows the lens to achieve a more thickened state and this reduces its refractive power. Okay. So the result here with the fattened lens is that you're going to increase the amount of light bending okay, and that allows you to focus on sub on an object that's near to your eye. Okay? The result is that um, you're going to be able to see an object close up as a result of the fact that the lens has fattened and you're able now to focus sharply on an object that's near your eye. Now you can actually do this if you hold your finger out at arm's length and attempt to keep it in focus as you bring it closer to the eye and you can feel the muscles um, changing the tension on the suspensory ligaments of the lens and the result is that you keep that finger in focus. Now as we age one of the things that happens is that the lens becomes stiffer and less easy to bend. The result of this is a condition known as presbyopia which means that it's difficult for people to focus on objects that are close up to their eye because the lens um, refuses to thicken very effectively. It gets difficult for us to change the shape of the lens. And so the, the fix for that are reading glasses, which are like magnifying glasses. And what they do is they reduce the focal length and so you can see objects close up much more easily as long as you have your readers on. Two events accompany the accommodation to allow for the ability to focus on near objects. Pupillary constriction limits the amount of scattered light and makes the objects appear blurry. This as a result um, causes the light that enters the edge of the lens uh, to bend. The objects appear more focused as a result. Okay. Convergence is a process by which the eyeballs move more medially to direct light rays onto the photoreceptor dense region of the fovea centralis um, known as the macula lutea. Okay? Um, so it, remember that the sweet spot of the retina is the area of the greatest density of cones. That's the macula lutea or yellow region. Okay? And the center of that is the fovea centralis and that's the region within the lutea that contains the greatest population of cones. Okay, um, we want to take a look here at some errors of refraction. So, Young people who have perfect vision for distance are able to use their soft crystalline lens to pull focus for near when they contract the ciliary body making the lens fatter. As we get older however this crystalline lens stiffens up and we lose this ability to pull focus for near so that objects such as books and magazines are blurred unless we put on reading spectacles. During normal vision, light first enters the eye through the cornea, then passes through the pupil and the lens where it is focused at a point on the retina at the back of the eye. Astigmatism is caused by a deformity of the eye in which the shape of the cornea is more oval and asymmetric than the normal round shape. This deformity causes light to focus on points in front of and or behind the retina instead of on the retina itself, causing images to be blurred or distorted. People with astigmatism may also report frequent headaches or eye strain. Astigmatism is a very common disorder and it can occur with either nearsightedness or farsightedness. 
Blurred or distorted vision caused by astigmatism can be improved by wearing glasses or contact lenses. Okay, we pick up uh, with the retina. This is the neural tunic of the eye that's involved in turning light and color uh, into vision, electrical information that we interpret as vision. The cell types layered in the inner retina include two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones, that are adjacent to the outer pigmented epithelial retina. So there's two layers of basically dark tissue inside the eyeball, and that's the choroid, which provides the blood supply that the retina requires to live, and also has a pigmented layer, and the pigmented retina, which is not neural tissue. The purpose of the dark color is to absorb light so it doesn't bounce around inside the eyeball and interfere with visual. The cones are the photoreceptors that function best in bright light for processing high-resolution color vision, while the rods are photoreceptors that don't detect color. Instead, they're most sensitive in low-light conditions, and they're a component of our peripheral vision. Photoreceptor synapse with bipolar cells, which are neurons that communicate with retinal ganglion cells. The retinal ganglion cells are found in the anteriormost region of the retina, and these axons eventually form the optic nerve, the second cranial nerve. The horizontal and the amacrine cells are involved in image processing. So you can see the different parts of the retina here. Remember, this would be the direction of the light, and we don't convert that light into electrical information until we actually hit the rods and the cones. Structural features of rods include a cylindrical outer portion, with thousands of flattened discs containing rhodopsin, which absorbs light. All rods have this pigment and don't distinguish between different light wavelengths, but only intensity. Rhodopsin is composed of opsin and retinol, which is derived from vitamin A. In the dark, retinol is in a bent configuration known as cis-retinol. So you can see here where the rods and the cones get their names, right? The cones have this cone-shaped uh, outer segment and the rods have this columnar shaped outer segment and you can see here the rhodopsin which is the opsin protein bound to the retinol and this is of course a membrane protein okay and we're going to find out that when light hits the retinol it changes the shape of this molecule that causes a shape change in the opsin and that's going to lead to ion movement that will eventually result in an action potential being sent via the optic nerve back to the brain. The cone's outer portions have the pigment iodopsin composed of retinol and photopsin which is similar in structure to opsin but has a slightly altered structure allowing it to absorb different wavelengths of light. There's three forms of photopsin that allow different responses to wavelengths perceived as blue, green, and red. And You can see that there's an overlap in the response curves of each of these three different types of cones it's the the mixture of the inputs from these cones that allows us the different ranges of color that we see when we look out on our environment now um, there are individuals that are born with defects in some of these cone proteins the result is that they have difficulty distinguishing between certain wavelengths of light you've probably heard of a condition known as color blindness um, where, for instance, an individual might be, not be able to distinguish between the colors red and green. This is inherited on the X chromosome, and that's why it affects more males than females. And there's no cure. Uh, they simply have to adjust to uh, a world in which red and green appear to be the same shade. Um, but this is at the level of the proteins that are found in the membranes of the cones. Transduction of light into electrical signals begins when a photon encounters a disk in the outer segment of the rod or cone. The following events occur when a photon of light reaches a photoreceptor. In the absence of stimulation, i.e. in the dark, photoreceptor cells are depolarized and continuously release neurotransmitter onto synapses with other neurons. This is the reverse 
of most neuron activation. So this is a special case. Okay, so in the dark, these guys are constantly spraying the afferent neurons with neurotransmitter, and that keeps them quiet. In the presence of light, photoreceptors get hyperpolarized and stop releasing neurotransmitter. This alters the activity of the neighboring retinal cells and sends information to the brain. In the dark, the opsin and the cisretinol combine, forming rhodopsin in the disc membrane of the rod. The G-protein complex transducin and photodiesterase are inactive, as shown here in the figure. Sodium ion channels in the plasma membrane of the outer segment are opened by second messenger's cyclic guanosine monophosphate, which is bound to them. This is an example, again, of the gradient's core principle. The result is that sodium ions flow down their concentration gradient and depolarize the cell. Now, this is all in the dark. When light strikes the photoreceptor, it causes the retinol to change to a trans configuration, and it separates from the opsin. This is activated um, in the presence of light. The transducin activates phosphodiesterase. Okay, so um, what's going to happen here is that the PDE is going to act on the cyclic GMP is going to cleave it and it's going to cause it to disengage from the sodium channel. The sodium ion channels then close and the photoreceptor hyperpolarizes. The phosphodiesterase converts cyclic GMP into GNP. Reduced levels of cyclic GMP cause a reduced number of open sodium channels the influx of sodium ions falls as a result. Okay, So what happens now, instead of a depolarization, is a hyperpolarization. Okay, So you're going to increase the charge differential between the inside and the outside of the cell. When light strikes the photoreceptor, the light causes the retinol to convert to transretinol and separate from the opsin. The activated transducin activates the PDE. Sodium ion channels close and the photoreceptor hyperpolarizes. The amount of sodium influx decreases. The rhodopsin is bleached when the transretinol dissociates from the opsin and no longer responds to light. The transretinol has to travel to the pigmented epithelial cells of the retina's outer layer where the cisretinol is reformed at the expense of ATP. The reformed cis-retinol is then transported back to the photoreceptor, and then we repeat the entire cycle. Okay? Now, the result of this is that in the hyperpolarized state, the rods and the cones are not going to release photoreceptor. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to release neurotransmitter onto their afferent neurons. The result of this is going to be the production of an action potential in the target. Light and dark adaptation allow for adjustments in the amount of light present in the environment. It partially depends on the size of the pupil. In the dark, when light is suddenly decreased, the cones can no longer function. The rods are slow to regenerate enough rhodopsin to function, and it can take up to 40 minutes for the rods to be completely functional. Thus, the retina is very sensitive. In the light, when light levels suddenly rise, it bleaches the rods and cones, resulting in a blinding glare. The rods become non-functional. The rhodopsin is bleached as fast as it's regenerated. The cones can regenerate functional pigment faster and are able to respond within a few minutes as their sensitivity decreases. Now what you're looking at here is the setup with the rods, the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells. So in the dark, what we see is constant production of neurotransmitter from the photoreceptor onto the bipolar cells. Glutamate inhibits the bipolar cells and reduces its release of neurotransmitter. Okay, So while the photoreceptors are hitting the bipolar cells, no neurotransmitter 
is released from the bipolars onto the ganglions. But in the light, what happens is that the hyperpolarization that's produced on the photoreceptors causes a cessation of the production of glutamate. The result is the bipolars can kick out neurotransmitter and the impact on the ganglion cells is to reach threshold to generate an action potential and that's what gets conducted back to the brain specifically we head via the optic nerve to the optic chiasm from the optic chiasm to the optic tracts from the optic tracts back to the thalamus and from the thalamus back to the occipital lobe so in summary photoreceptor in the dark depolarizes releasing glutamate onto bipolar cells which inhibits the bipolar cells decreasing its release of neurotransmitter the retinal ganglion cell doesn't produce an action potential so no signals are sent to the brain through the optic nerve image processing from the retina in the absence of light consists of light hyperpolarizing the photoreceptor stopping the release of glutamate the bipolar cells are freed from inhibition and depolarize and release neurotransmitter onto the retinal ganglion cells the retinal ganglion cells produce action potentials which are sent back to the brain through the optic nerve. Now we talked a little bit about color blindness already. Remember that it's the result of mutations in genes carried on the X chromosome. Um, it mostly affects men. About 10% of men have this condition. Fewer than 1% of women because they would have to have two defective copies of the gene in order for the condition to show up since it is recessive sex-linked recessive to be specific. Um, the gene for the blue pigment is not on the X chromosome and a mutation it is much less common in both sexes so it's possible to lack all three pigments but this is very rare. Colorblindness has no cure. Most people learn to compensate by looking for clues such as intensity and location. As an example the red light is the top of a traffic signal most common tests include Ishihara plates, indicated down here in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, which are dots with a number of embedded um, colors. In the plate below, a person with red-green color blindness would not be able to detect the number 74 and would see a 21 instead. The reliable color blindness tests require looking at the original plate. So I hope you can all see the 74 down there in the inset. It's also in your um, textbook but uh, again this is a number one of a number of conditions that exists on the X chromosome um, that disproportionately affects men because the Y chromosome has no trait on it other than the trait of being male and so any defect on the X chromosome whether it be from a dominant or recessive gene will show up in the male Okay, let's take a look at visual pathways. Hi everyone, this is Mr. Herbst here, and today's focus is going to be on visual nerve pathways of light and images through the eye and brain. Now that's a little bit confusing, but uh, think of it like this. You have stuff that you see, and it has to be handled by your brain. Um, now, it, it, things, get do, things get pretty confusing when you think about where the light goes, but uh, let's say, for example, that you have things in your right visual field. These are things that you see in the right side of your body. They are actually handled by the left side of each corresponding eyeball. Now, why does that happen? Well, because the eye is a convex lens. So here we have the lens of the eye right here that I'm circling in red. Uh, that is a convex lens. A convex lens is thicker in the middle and thinner on the outside. So what does that do to the image? Well, here we have a convex lens. That's L right here. Uh, you may have seen this in physics, but on this side, things are coming into your eye. And on this side, this is where this is the inside of your eye. So let's say that you're looking at a candle. The candle is right side up. Now, when it enters your eye, the convex lens is actually going to invert the image, flip it upside down. So even though you may be looking at it right side up, it's going to be upside down when it's projected on the back of your retina. Now, that's a little bit confusing to think about. So here's a diagram of pathways of light through the eye. 
So in blue is everything that you see on the right side of your body. So go ahead and follow the blue back. It's handled by, it's processed by the left side of each corresponding eye. So it's handled by this region here of each corresponding eye. That happens because of your eye lens inverts the image. Now in your left eye, the blue, which is on the temporal side of your body, temp temporal means temple, is going to travel down the temporal nerve and eventually make its way to the back of the brain. Now on this side here, something a little bit more confusing happens. This here is on the nasal side of your, of your body. That means it's close to your nose. So your right eye, the left side of your right eye is closer to your nose. So the image is going to pass down the nasal fiber here, but it's going to have to do something weird. It's going to have to cross over at what's called the optic chiasm. So the nerve is actually going to cross over to the other side of your brain at the optic chiasm. So the left side of your brain is going to handle everything that you see on the right side of your body. However, um, with your with your left eye, it never has to cross over. But it, with, when things are uh, things are processed in your right eye, things do have to cross over. The opposite happens with things that are handled by your left field of vision, right here. Follow the red back, and you follow those those nasal fibers back, and they have to cross over at the optic chiasm. Things in the in your right field of vision are handled by the temporal nerve. Once again they don't have to cross over. So they are going to go ahead and just travel down the temporal ner nerve to the right side of your visual cortex and they're going to be handled by the brain. So let's go ahead and review that comp complicated mumbo jumbo. All images are processed by opposite sides of the eye than what you may think. That happens because the lens of the eye inverts the image that you look at. There are nasal close to the nose and there are temporal fibers which are close to the temple. Nasal fibers, those are the ones that are close to your nose, have to cross over at the optic chiasm, but temporal fibers do not. Here I have another picture. Let's go ahead and investigate this a little bit further. In green, I represent things that are, pro that are, that are coming in from your right field of vision, things that are on the right side of your body. Follow the green back and they are handled by the temporal side of your left eye and the nasal side of your right eye. So the green will travel down the temporal fibers of your left eye and it won't have to cross over and it will go to the left side of your brain. Now uh, the, the opposite happens in your right eye. Your right eye is going to handle things from your right field of vision but the left side or the nasal side of your right eye is going to be the one processing the image. So things are going to travel down and they're going to have to cross over at the optic chiasm and they are going to then be process processed by your left visual cortex. That's the left side of your brain. Now here's where things get a little bit even more confusing. Let's say that you had a tumor that was pressing up against the temporal side of your right side of your body. Let's say that you had a tumor pressing up right against here. So it's going to ruin all those uh, those nerve synapses or those nerve connections on that side of your body. Where are you going to lose the vision in that eye? Well, follow follow the, the lines back, back to red over here. Where What handles red? The left side of your body, the, the right side, the temporal side of your right eye handles your left field of vision. So you are going to actually lose vision on your left side in that eye. Confusing? Sort of. Definitely confusing. Just remember that everything is opposite of what you may think. So you're pushing, if you have a tumor pressing up on the right side or the temporal side of your right eye, you're going to actually lose vision on the left side of your body. That is a little bit confusing. Now let's go ahead and say that you had a tumor pressing up against your optic chiasm right there in the middle. And believe it or not, that can, act, that can actually happen in some individuals. So, so all the fibers right there at the optic chiasm are going to be ruined by that tumor. Follow the nasal fibers back. So if we follow them back, here we are in the nasal region of our right eye. What, what, proce what does this process? Well, that handles the right field of vision. So things on the outside of our body. Go ahead and follow this back. 
that handles the left field of vision. So the temporal fibers are unaffected. Those are these regions right here. These guys are still unaffected. However, these are the ones that handle stuff on the inside. So if you have a tumor pressing up against the optic chiasm, you're still going to be able to see, but you're going to have tunnel vision. Stuff that's right in the middle of your body is all you're going to be able to see. Because again, the only fibers that are unaffected are the ones that are on the temporal side of your body. Those handle stuff that's on the opposite side. So you're still going to be able to see stuff, but it's only going to be right here in the middle. You're going to be able to only see tunnel vision. You're going to lose all your peripheral vision. This stuff all will go away if there was a tumor pressing up against the optic chiasm. Now, image processing by the brain involves more than the detection and conscious awareness of visual stimuli. Retinal axons project to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus and the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe where the image from the retina gets mapped. Visual information follows two main pathways from the primary cortex. The dorsal pathway leads to the parietal lobe and the ventral pathway ends in the inferior temporal lobe. The dorsal pathway is associated with the interpretation of motion, while the ventral pathway is associated with the processing of colors and forms of objects. Other regions of the brain are associated with visual memory and behavioral decision making that are based on these cues. And so you can see here an example of how it is that vision takes place, right? So what we have is light reflected off an object that passes through the four transparent layers of the eyeball, the cornea, the aqueous humor in the anterior chamber, the lens, then the vitreous humor in the posterior chamber. From there it gets focused on to the macula lutea, specifically the fovea centralis, which is the greatest concentration of cones in the retina of the eye that generates an action potential via the hyperpolarization of the photoreceptors leading to reduction of glutamate on the bipolar cells which causes neurotransmitter release onto the ganglion cells that feed into the optic nerve. The optic nerve then leads back to the optic chiasm which then leads back to the optic tracts, which project onto the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, we head back to the occipital lobe of the brain, where we label that information as to um, its shape, its color. And then the ventral and dorsal pathways pipe the information to the parietal and the temporal lobes where we make associations in regard to motion and with regard to images that are stored in memory. Okay, our next special sense is the ear. Now, odd as it seems, the ear is actually responsible for two special sensations, the ability to hear and also the ability to maintain our balance. So if we look at the anatomy of the ear, it's got three main components. The external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And each region has a role in hearing, while only the inner ear is associated with balance. We call that our vestibular sense. And the two main structures that um, are key in our ability to maintain our balance, whether we're not moving or whether we're moving, are the semicircular canals. You can see up here. Um, and the... Uh, vestibular apparatus down here. Okay, um, all of this is embedded in the temporal bone. Okay, and what divides the different parts of the ear, um, the external from the middle, is the eardrum or tympanic membrane. The middle ear runs from the tympanic membrane to the cochlea, specifically the uh, oval window of the cochlea. And then the inner ear consists of the semicircular canals, vestibular apparatus, and the cochlea. The outer ear is the externally visible region of the ear. 
It has the following features. The auricle or pinna, which is elastic cartilage with the exception of the lobule that's covered with skin. And it helps to funnel sound waves into the external auditory canal. The external auditory canal, or meatus, which is slightly curved and runs through the temporal bone and terminates at the tympanic membrane. The canal is lined with modified sweat glands known as ceruminous glands that generate earwax, which is a yellowish-brown gray substance that retards mold growth and keeps insects out of the ear. Earwax lubricates and waterproofs the canal and tympanic membrane. It also helps to trap and remove debris before it reaches it. The tympanic membrane is a thin sheet of epithelia and connective tissue, and it separates the outer and middle ear regions. The membrane is cone-shaped with an apex or tip pointing into the middle ear. It's connected to a tiny bone or ossicle. Uh, the three ossicles are the tiniest bones in the body. They are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The malleus is attached to the drum. Uh, the incus is medial to the malleus. And then the um, stapes actually rests on the oval window of the cochlea. And this is what enables the sound waves to ultimately reach the inner ear. It's the movement of these bones um, generating fluid movement in the cochlea that's going to result now in movement of hair cells inside the cochlea that are suspended within this fluid and attached um, to a basilar and associated with a tectoral membrane. When these cells bounce up and down, the cilia open ion gates and that results in the movement of potassium into these um, hair cells resulting in a depolarization. That information gets piped back via the eighth cranial nerve to the temporal lobe of the brain and that's where we attach meaning to what we hear, language, sound, what have you.